The Atheist Debates Patreon Project presents Debate Review Part 3, Is Secular Humanism Superior to Christianity? Matt Dillahunty versus Matt Slick. So welcome back to this continuing process of reviewing this debate. I didn't really anticipate that it was going to take four videos, but as I look at the content for the third video, it may well do that. We've made it about halfway through Matt Slick's opening statements, and we've talked about the logical absolutes, brain fizz, and claims that secular humanism is self-refuting, along with confusion about whether or not we can evaluate a strategy that doesn't also explain the rules of the game. But he hasn't really addressed secular humanism's strategy. He's just falsely claimed that it can't be a better strategy because it can't explain reason. In this debate about whether one strategy is superior to the other, are we going to get some description of Christianity such that it's clear that secular humanism can't be superior? We've been told that under the secular humanist worldview, our brains are just making us say stuff. With that problem on the table, how does Christianity solve it? In the Christian worldview, on the other hand, human minds are not limited to the physical realm. We believe that our minds are different than our brains, though our brains are affected when you know, our minds are affected by the brains and physical things. In the Christian perspective, since we're made in the image of God, Genesis 1.26, and we're able to think God's thoughts after him, that means be logical, we're able to provide a reason for trusting our logical inferences because we work from the position that we as persons are not limited to the laws of physics and neurochemical wiring. We escape that logical problem. You may or may not agree with this, but at least it's not a self-refuting position. Whereas the secular humanist assumption that nature is all there is without God being part of the equation leads to doubt one's own logical abilities and undermines the validity of secular humanism. So here we have the clear statement that Christianity holds that minds aren't restricted to the physical realm. Well, great, you believe that, but why? It's a claim, not an argument. Christianity also holds that they're not limited to physics. Great, you believe that, but why? It's a claim, not an argument and not a reason for it. Oh, well, he believes it because this is what the Bible says. Okay, great. Why should we accept that the Bible is true? We can carry this on back uh, ad nauseum. But what he says at the end is that you may not believe this, but at least it's not self-refuting. Well, we've already talked about how secular humanism isn't actually self-refuting, and I'll talk about that a bit more later, too. But the real key here is that this leads to doubt, and doubt, from Slick's perspective, is the enemy. Faith and doubt, this conflict uh, of, of certitude about one's beliefs, is age-old. These ideas that minds aren't restricted to the physical realm are appealing because they give the appearance of solving a problem. They get rid of the doubts we have about, hey, is the physical all there is? Is there more? How do we understand ourselves? How do we establish a foundation for reason? These placeholder arguments or claims from biblical authority or any sort of spiritual revelation about, oh, well, your minds aren't restricted to the physical realm, are attempts to solve a mystery by appealing to bigger mysteries. They don't provide anything that offer us an understanding or an explanation. The fact that something is sufficient to explain a situation doesn't mean that it's necessarily the correct or true explanation. There's necessary and sufficient. You have to have both. If you were to walk up and say, how did this fire start? Well, there's a burnt match on the floor. Yes, that's a sufficient explanation. Uh, or leads to a sufficient explanation of how the fire started. But is that what actually happened? Meanwhile, for these issues, we're not even confident that there is a solution or that the proposed solution that they're offering is in fact sufficient. Because how can its magic ever be a better answer than I don't know? Why is reason reliable? Because it reflects the mind of God, or because God says so, or because God, period. Those aren't explanations. They don't do anything to increase our understanding. And it's not clear that the existence of a God necessarily serves as a foundation for reason being reasonable, being reliable. How can a perfect being make it so that you can trust 
your reasoning. How can a dirty filter of a human, even if you pour clear water through it, actually lead to clear water? If there's a problem with having to be in this position of trusting your brain, you don't escape that by appealing to a God because that's also something that you have to trust your brain for. But the scientific method is based on philosophical assumptions. First of all, it assumes the validity of the laws of logic. Now, the laws of logic are not testable via science. They must be assumed, but if science is the method by which we know things and learn things, then it cannot be the thing we use to validate logic. After all, the scientific method has to presuppose the validity of the laws of logic in order to carry out logical experiments. You don't take a photograph of logical processes, you don't freeze them. Instead, the secular humanist, same as a Christian, must presuppose their validity. And to do so is a philosophical undertaking. Therefore, at the very basic level, the scientific method is a philosophical approach to a material world. Great. So both the secular humanist and the Christian presuppose the laws of logic as a philosophical exercise. We're in agreement about this. We've discussed it over and over. How is this in any way an objection to secular humanism? Now, don't get me wrong. We Christians also assume the validity of the laws of logic, but at least we can justify them. We can say they are rooted in the mind of God, who is the absolute, omnipotent, omnipresent being, who is the necessary precondition, and that we, by using them, we can have confidence and trust in their universal consistency. Well, that's rather strange. I thought we both had to presuppose them, and now he's saying that Christians can justify the laws of logic. If you can justify something, you don't need to presuppose it. You don't need to assume that it's true. You can justify that it's true. And how do they justify it? Because they can say it's because of God. Well, to quote Matt Slick, just because people say it doesn't make it so. So continuing on with the here's everything that's wrong with secular humanism, according to Matt Slick, Secular humanism relies on science, which presupposes the laws of logic. But science also presupposes something else that's a problem. And I know that Matt likes science, and I love science. I may love it a lot more than a lot of you atheists out there. No disrespect, men. I love science. I wanted to be a marine biologist. And I loved watching documentaries. I love science. I do. I really enjoy it. I think it's great. A lot of benefits from it. I have no problem with that. I love studying, basically, cladistics. I love studying uh, information theory. I love studying DNA and uh, all that happens in that level. I'm reading books on quantum physics. I actually enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's about as much as I enjoy heavy metal. Yeah. Now, to me, science is a lot of fun. But science is a philosophy. It's an idea opposed upon the physical realm by people in order to figure things out. So Matt loves science. He may even love it more than we do. And he thinks it's fun. But it's a philosophy, an idea imposed. I'm assuming he meant when he said opposed. Imposed upon the physical realm by people in order to figure things out. Well, no, Matt, it's not really a philosophy. And it hasn't been since it stopped being referred to as natural philosophy in the 19th century and began to be identified as modern science. Matt's simplistic, archaic description is like failing to recognize the difference between astrology and astronomy. Science isn't some philosophy that we impose upon the physical realm. It's a methodological system of tools that have been demonstrated to consistently produce the most reliable descriptions of reality. It's no more an idea we impose on reality than logic is. It's an application of logic where the premises of an argument are grounded in empirical observations. Now, second, science presupposes the regularity of nature. Now, this is an important thing. I hope you guys get this. So that's also not quite right. Science doesn't just presuppose that nature is regular. They don't just, hey, we're just going to go with this, as if we just kind of pulled it out of thin air. There's a provisional presupposition or a provisional acceptance of the likelihood that nature is regular because we observe regularity in nature. And if we consistently observe regularity in nature and we haven't observed irregularity, then it's not a presupposition that nature is regular. 
it is simply an acknowledgement that until such time as irregularity is demonstrated, we don't have any good reason to think in those terms. The null hypothesis is something that can't be proved, and perhaps it may be impossible to demonstrate irregularity, and this could be considered a null hypothesis. But what science does, it begins with a principal assumption, but that assumption can be revised when there's good reason to support irregularity. And some scientists have proposed irregularities that gravity may have worked differently at different times or in different places. But the time to believe them is after there's evidence for it, not when it's just a mere speculative possibility. Science isn't claiming certainty or pronouncing that things can't work differently in different places in different times. This is the issue of certainty that plagues Matt's idea. Science doesn't claim certainty. Science doesn't make pronouncements of truth. But Matt needs certainty and Matt needs truth. And he seems to think that science may be a pathway to truth, but that's not what science is. Matt loves science, but he doesn't understand it because he thinks that science is making proclamations of truth or certainty because that's what he needs. When what it's really making are tentative, probabilistic models that are the best current interpretation of the evidence. It's simply saying, based on what we understand, this is the most reasonable conclusion we can make. It is a relative assessment. It doesn't make appeals to certainty. To, to assume that because things have behaved consistently in the past, they therefore will also behave consistently in the future is to beg the question. It is to assume the very thing you're trying to prove. So in our continual parade of what's wrong with secular humanism, let's see, secular humanism relies on logic, but it can't justify logic. And it relies on science, but it can't justify science. And science relies on logic, and science can't justify logic. And it seems that he's just setting up this entire parade where, oh, now science presupposes regularity in nature. And science presupposes that the past and the future are going to be the same. And this is question begging because you're you're assuming the very thing that you're trying to prove, except that that's not true. Presuming a regularity or assuming for the sake of getting things done that today is going to be pretty much like yesterday is not begging the question because we're not trying to prove that today is like yesterday. If I'm trying as a scientist to demonstrate that a particular drug likely causes cancer, assuming that things are likely to work the same in my lab and in the human body, or similarly tomorrow as they did today is not question begging because I'm not setting out to prove that things will work that way. Science describes things as they are, as they've been found, as they are observed, and tries to construct predictive models that are about saying, look, unless some significant fact changes, my results from today should be indicative of of future results. These results should be considered typical. And as we go through life, we continue to see this regularity. Simply acknowledging that this model consistently provides useful results that make accurate predictions also isn't a claim of truth. Matt wants to fault science as if it's making truth claims or absolute claims, but that's not what science does, as we've already pointed out. It's probabilistic, tentative, and subject to revision. He seems to understand the problem of induction, and you can look this up in, in the field of epistemology and read David Hume's An Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding. The problem of induction is something that supposedly plagues science, but what science really does is, is given this issue of induction, we are going to be very clear about what we're saying, that these are my test results, and assuming things continue to operate the way this works, these results should be considered predictive of others. And if we find something that shows this is wrong, then we'll rework this. And maybe we'll find out that, you know, things have changed over time or that things have changed in space, that we, there's not the regularity we see. But what I don't understand is how you, somebody can understand this problem of induction and yet fail to understand that science isn't claiming certainty. To use this as a, as a criticism of science, it seems that if 
what you understand about science only comes from poorly communicated, sensationalized headlines about science or an early science class that gives you the impression that, oh, what, we're, what, we're, what science is relaying is knowledge, which is truth, and that's certainty. If you build up this model in your head, then it appears there's a conflict. But if you understand science for what it's actually doing, which is describing things as they are and using those descriptions to make predictions, not to make declarations that things were, will necessarily be tomorrow the way we've defined them as today, if you understand that that's what science is doing, then the problems that Matt's raising vanish. But the other thing here is that these problems aren't problems with secular humanism. They're not problems with the model that I presented of how secular humanism attempts to find the best strategy for human flourishing. These are all distractions, all this hand waving about, oh, it can't prove science and science has these problems and it can't prove logic and logic has these issues and all this. This is a parade of confusion and distraction that in no way tells us why secular humanism as a strategy for human flourishing is not superior to Christianity. Because by the way, these issues that he's claiming exist, they're not solved in any way by appealing to Christianity. Because what Christianity is doing is no more than saying, hey, I got this problem solved, the solution is X, with no demonstration that the solution actually is real. On the other hand, Christianity, in Christianity, since God exists and made the universe, and since we understand that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, Malachi 3, 6, and since we know that God does not deceive us, Titus 1, 2, we can trust that the universe is made in a consistent and predictable manner, and that we can apply the laws of logic, which reflect his logic, logical, perfect, and ordered mind, in order to learn about the world we live in. Yes, I, I know that you believe that, but what happened to this point? Just because people say it doesn't make it so. And that's also true for things written in the Bible or any other book. I know that people grew up on Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, but saying it doesn't make it so. Slick, though, thinks that this confidence in God serving as the foundation for reason, regularity, and all of the things he just criticized about science was essential to the development of science. Well, once again, he's confused ancient natural philosophy in the days of alchemy and astrology with secular science that shifted from natural philosophy to modern science, when one of the key changes was a firm grounding in methodological naturalism and the elimination of spectral evidence and appeals to the supernatural. But let's hear what he has to say. In fact, this very belief was a necessary precondition that made it possible for science to develop in the Middle Ages. Do your research, you'll find that's the case. Scientists who were Christians trusted that God would not trick them, that nature was consistent since it was made by God, and that they could then use logic in the process. So Matt's actually largely correct here. In many places, particularly in Europe, the motivation to seek out how the universe worked was based on this idea that God wasn't trying to trick you and God had created an orderly universe and you could discover that orderly universe. But this wasn't necessary for everyone, so I don't know why, what the justification is for saying that this was a necessary component. There are individual scientists who didn't even necessarily think that the universe was orderly. There was this idea of exploration. Can we find out what order there is? It was perhaps necessary to encourage Europeans to depart from the way that Asians viewed the world, which was essentially, this is the way it is. There's no point in trying to figure out how it works. This is the way it is. It was almost a static view. I'd recommend watching the Connection series from James Burke, or The Day the Universe Changed, also from James Burke. But the fact that ancient people began their particular pursuit of scientific knowledge, of natural philosophy, because they were convinced that the universe was orderly because of God is completely irrelevant to this discussion and almost any other that doesn't specifically address what were their motivations. Because their motivations aren't relevant as to whether or not the universe is orderly and reliable, 
And they're also not relevant as to whether or not we know why nature is or isn't orderly and reliable. It's as if he's using this to say, hey, look, without this appeal to God, we never would have had science. Well, that may or may not be the case. But whether or not there is a God is separate from whether or not there's a belief in a God. And whether or not the universe is orderly and reliable and predictable is also separate from whether or not a God exists, and it's separate from whether or not people believed in a God. So this is all just a bunch of hand-waving. It's an interesting look at history, but it's only part of the story, and it doesn't do anything to address secular humanism as a strategy for human flourishing. Now, I know that Mr. Dillahani affirms uh, consequentialism because it states on his Wiki Iron Chariot site that, quote, actions are judged uh, based on their likely consequences. So first of all, while I did create and own ironchariots.org along with Russell Glasser, I didn't write everything there. As a matter of fact, I wrote a tiny portion of what's there, and it would be a mistake to think that I support an idea merely because it's posted on a site that I own. It would have been much better to simply review my talks on secular morality if Slick really wanted to understand my particular take on morality, which is not the simplistic version of consequentialism with harm as its foundation, not the version that he's getting ready to object to. At the outset, I'd also said that this debate wasn't about morality. We could have a debate about morality, but I don't think he'd have been any more on topic for that debate than he was for this one. So I'm only going to address two quick points from his brief diversion into the subject of morality. If, for example, the consequentialist says that the standard of good and bad is that which reduces harm, then consequentialism is refuted since it assumes the evaluation of harm is a standard by which consequentialism is justified. But this is to appeal to something other than itself. It's a vicious circle. It's like saying the consequences of an action are to be judged by how, har how much harm it causes, and we use harm to judge whether consequences are good or bad. Okay, for, so for somebody who's supposedly really good at logic, he loves talking about uh, things that he gets wrong. Justification to something outside of oneself isn't circular. Circular is when the justification is already included in the actual argument, where the premise includes the conclusion in some way. When we're talking about consequentialism with regard to harm, if we're appealing to something outside of consequentialism, that's not circular. And while I don't advocate for harm in the simple sense as the foundation, instead I use a broader definition of well-being based on the physical facts of reality, it's not circular to view the consequences of an action with respect to a goal. That's all we ever do. That's what all of all versions of morality do, is evaluate the consequences of actions with respect to a goal. Hey, you killed somebody. That's the consequence. What was the goal? Not killing someone. Hey, you failed. What we're talking about is an assertion that we're going to care about harm or well-being or whatever it is we're using as a standard. And we're going to compare the consequences of our actions to that goal. Now, my version is actually broader because it takes motivations and uh, impact of actions beyond, you know, localized phenomena into account. But his objection here is, why should you care about harm? And that is completely irrelevant as to whether or not we do care about harm. That's like saying, why care about human flourishing? Well, we could have that discussion about why we care about human flourishing, but if we do in fact care about human flourishing and we're going to have a conversation about which model, which strategy is superior in fostering human flourishing, it is a complete distraction and, and disregard for the conversation to say, well, why do we care about human flourishing? It's irrelevant because we do care. You can't give a reason to care about human flourishing, so your view can't be superior. Really? Now we're back to the chess analogy from the first video. Would it be superior if I said, well, you care about human flourishing because of your belief in God, and he cares because of his belief in a different God, and I care because I flipped a coin and decided that flourishing is worth caring about. Those are subjective and arbitrary. But the reason why you care about something is separate from the fact that you do. And the strategy is about what we care about, not why we care about it.
pornography. For example, let's say that there is a woman who's in a coma in a hospital. A man is working at the hospital, and we went over this last night, and he rapes her. No one ever finds out about this rape. Has harm uh, occurred to her? Then no. If no harms occurred to her, no mental, no emotional, no physical harm, then in that view, you can't say that it was wrong. You would have to say that harm is no longer the standard, and the consequences aren't, aren't the standard either. You have to appeal to the very act that is wrong by nature, and that refutes consequentialism. So no, actually this doesn't refute consequentialism. It identifies a problem with Matt Slick's gross oversimplification of a simplistic harm-based consequentialism that myopically ignores other aspects of harm other than the individual who this uh, assault was directed at. But I'm not advocating for a simple harm-based consequentialism. But even if I were, this objection fails. And here's why. There's a woman in a, ho in a coma. If she's raped and nobody ever finds out about it, then there's no harm and therefore you can't say it's wrong. Well, that's entirely wrong. Because if you live in this sort of society where raping someone in a coma isn't viewed as wrong, your entire quality of life is diminished in anticipation of what could happen to you if you were in a coma. There's a reason why we respect the wishes of the dead because consistently doing that allows them to live a life comforted by the knowledge that their wishes are respected, even when they're not there to defend them. Oh, but he said no one ever finds out. Well, the person who did it knows, and it affects the decisions they make and the conclusions they reach about right and wrong, which affects the broader impact on society. This analogy that he's constructed is hopelessly cartoonish and it is so narrowly focused that it ignores the entire spectrum of things that we need to consider when evaluating harm. And if we broaden consequentialism to go from mere aspects of harm to talk about well-being, which is a much more accurate model of this, things like this problem here vanish because we understand that our beliefs inform our actions and our actions have consequences for ourselves and others. And even doing something that nobody knows about that you think you've gotten away with ignores the fact that whether or not we as a society consider something to be wrong impacts how we live within that society. And if you realize and your entire culture were convinced that, hey, we don't have any justification for saying that raping a, someone in a coma is, is wrong then you may well live your entire life diminished by the fear of what might happen to you as soon as you lose consciousness. And instead, if you foster these ideas within people that the harm that's being done impacts the people who are currently alive, who may be in that situation in the future, if you remove yourself from a myopic view of we're only going to look at one little minute thing of harm and broaden yourself to a wider view, the issue fades away. And Matt's objection, which doesn't even refute simple consequentialism, simple harm-based consequentialism, becomes the cartoon that it is. It is an objection that is not remotely solved by appealing to things other than secular morality. They might say, well, under a Christian model, even if nobody on earth finds out, God knows that it happened and God will take the appropriate action. But this is coming from people who also believe that God might just forgive that action. That, hey, nobody found out, this person later you know, sought redemption, and so there will be no justice for that. This justice-based mentality with regard to morality is poisoning their ability to see the truth about human interaction and human flourishing, which is why they can, anytime there's a conversation about, well, let's talk about strategies for human flourishing, they can say, hey, why do we care about human flourishing at all? But don't get me wrong, I do care about human flourishing. I really do. I care about human flourishing, but you don't have any reason to care about it, and so why are we having this discussion? Indeed, one might ask, why are we having this discussion? Uh, because one of us actually cares about the conversation and establishing an understanding and coming up with sound foundations for why we hold certain positions. And the other one already thinks that they're right and just wants to dismiss everything that's said.
So that gets to the end of the closing remarks. And I've decided after some review that I'm not going to bother going through the cross-examination period for several reasons. First of all, many people felt that the cross-examination was a waste of time. If there is a demand to review specific portions, I may do that at a later time, but I've spent enough time reviewing the cross-examination for now. I want to give you, at first, a short three or four minute clip from the very beginning of the cross-examination period so that you get a feel for what begins to take place, which it later just degenerates into a conversation that's not even the right word. A claim about brain fizz after another claim about brain fizz, and it's a mess. But you can watch the entire thing for yourself. So watch this clip. That's the first portion of the cross-examination period. And when it's over, we'll wrap this all up with what I think happened and what I think didn't happen. And I'll apologize in advance for the first question, which some people may think is in poor form, but I, I have good reason. When we first started talking about this debate, you submitted a half a dozen different debate topics which were grammatically or logically flawed and tried to put me defending a position of philosophical naturalism when I pointed out that my position is actually methodological naturalism and that I wasn't keen on any of those topics. We finally agreed on debating whether or not secular humanism is superior to Christianity. And I've repeatedly pointed out my issue with philosophical naturalism. Why did you want to go ahead and agree to this debate topic if all you were really going to do is once again talk about the logical absolutes? Did you say all I was going to do? Because I, I, if you heard a debate, I didn't just talk about the logical absolutes. I also well, talked about ethics. I also talked about science, presuppositions, and things like that. Mm -hmm. It just seemed like I presented uh, the justifications. And, I, and what you did was you tried to say that if something is self-refuting, then it must be inferior to something that's not self-refuting. Except that that's not true. Because something that's self-refuting isn't necessarily inferior on subject A for something that isn't self-refuting that has nothing to do with A. Whatever that means. Um, sure. The, does, the Christianity, issue... does Christianity care about human, human flourishing? Of course it does. Okay. So Christianity cares about human flourishing and secular humanism cares about human flourishing. Yeah. Be fruitful and multiply. Sure. Right. If we were to, we're stuck in reality, as best we can tell. I think so. I'm not a solipsist. Well, Hey, we get to avoid that one. Uh, <clears throat> so now we're stuck here and we're trying to find out the best. Do you care about human flourishing? Of course I do. Sure. I do too. This is what's so frustrating because I think that we agree human flourishing is a good idea. And now I ask the question, how's the, what's the best way to go about it? Do we listen to what? Sex. Sex? That's one of the best ways for the human flourish. That, that, that's a good way to propagate the species, but if you think human flourishing is only about sex, then we should have one another of. debate. That's one of. I mean, well, you can't flourish without that. Oh, I don't know. I think, there, I think there are plenty of people who don't engage in sex and can't engage in sex and yet still live full lives. Oh, uh, that, but that's not the same thing as flourishing and expanding and flourishing. So you're defining human flourishing as whatever it takes to propagate the species. No, that's evolutionary. Yeah. So. Okay, so are we gonna get back to like serious questions? Because I got yeah. us to a point of agreement. And so now you and I are stuck here on this planet and we wanna find the best way to reach conclusions about how we should interact. Best way to reach conclusions about how we should interact, okay. Is, is it, that would contribute to our flourishing, right? Well, it's an assertion you made that we both want that. I'm not necessarily agreeing I with it, but I think it's- I that we both want it. I asked you if you cared about her human flourishing yes. and you said yes. Yes, I did. So it's not an assertion on my point. I'm going with your answer. No, answers. the other sentence I just quoted, not about flourishing, but the other thing you said. But go ahead. You and I are on a planet together, right? Yep. Okay. We care about our, what's in our best interest, and we have to share space. Yeah, I do care about those. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So isn't it in our best interest to find the best ways <laughs> to get the right answer or the closest to right answer about our, our ability to flourish? Yeah, I'll, I'll go with that for now. That's sure. sufficient. How do we do that? Read the Bible. And there you have it. Read the Bible. The closest thing to a defense of a position that I think we're likely to get out of this. 
after the debate was over, I was asked by several people, why did you play his game during the cross-examination when he was just deflecting and talking about brain fizz and all these things rather than having an actual conversation about the best strategy for flourishing? Well, part of the reason is because the alternative is to just match brain fizz with brain fizz. Addressing his points shows that I do have responses, that I care about what he's saying, that I'm willing to consider things and not just deflect. It exposes the flaws in his position, and it allows me to present in my closing the truth that he didn't really address the topic. Uh, I came here to talk about how secular humanism is superior to Christianity when it comes to human flourishing. I outlined why I think that's the case, and it has to do with the, the foundational principle of having human flourishing as its central goal, along with the methods. Um, Matt and I agree that we share a reality. We agree that we can reach correct conclusions even without appealing to God. We just don't necessarily agree on whether or not you can justify it, which is why we spent so much time on something that's secondary to whether or not secular humanism is, under the definition of superior, su superior more adept at reaching the preferred goal. For me, when I look at this, it's the method and the results that determine whether or not a system is better. And at no point today did I hear the method or results relating to human flourishing from a Christian standpoint. Instead, my answer is that secular humanism is better for these reasons. And his answer is to ignore the methods, ignore the goals, make a claim that, yes, Christianity cares about human flourishing, but Secular humanism can't demonstrate that the laws of logic are true and can't demonstrate that reality is reasonable and there's this infinite regress of all these problems and you have no foundation to make any declarations about anything and this makes it self-refuting, therefore I win. And that's not reality. So maybe we don't share reality. Because from where I sit, I've got to make a decision about what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. And if somebody comes up and says, hey, if you believe in Jesus, you'll go to heaven. What about the decision I'm making? What have you taught me about the, the way to actually make a decision on this issue? Why should I interact and care with people? I'm actually looking and thinking about it. And it may be just brain fizz, although my brain isn't merely chemicals. Electrochem the, fact that, the fact that two chemicals put together can't get to truth doesn't mean that a more complex collection of chemicals cannot then reason effectively. And the appeal to individual, independent confirmation of what I've thought about, getting the thoughts from other people, is how I check that I'm not delusional. Saying that I can't prove I'm not delusional doesn't show that I am, doesn't show that I'm wrong, and doesn't show in any way that the Christian worldview somehow trumps secular humanism when it comes to human flourishing. When you're in a live debate, you have to make decisions and you have to make them quick. When it became clear that I wasn't going to get a discussion on the topic, that he was going to make every attempt to be flippant and deflect, I decided it was better to go with the discussion at hand and then expose the failures in my closing. At the beginning of his opening, he said it was his honor and privilege to, pre to defend what he believes about the word of God. But he seemed to kind of ignore this. He just really stated what his views were, made appeals to the Word of God, as if that was the defense rather than defending the Word of God. And he wasn't required to defend the Word of God. He was just required to demonstrate that secular humanism wasn't superior to Christianity. Playing his game allowed me to show that these presuppositionalist attempts to avoid the topic with, well, how do you know that? Or your brain just made you say that? Or that's all just brain fizz? Are all predicated on a false assumption about the necessity of truth and certainty and the delusion that their view solves a problem for which there may not be a solution. Strategy is contingent upon framework, the rules and goals of what you're talking about. Strategy isn't contingent upon explaining why the rules are what they are. Secular humanism as a strategy doesn't need to explain why reason is reasonable. It doesn't need to solve the problems of induction or hard solipsism. It merely acknowledged that it's working within the framework of reality 
as we understand it, which means that there's nothing self-refuting about this because acknowledging that you don't know something can only be self-refuting if you claim that you know. And when apologists hear us say that we know this is the better way or that we are convinced this is the better way, what they seem to hear in their head is we are absolutely certain because they are living in a framework that makes them convinced that they are absolutely certain. The proposition that God solves all of these problems related to scientific foundations and reasoning and solipsism, the reasoning that the presuppositionalists use claiming that God solves this isn't demonstrated. And it may in fact be impossible to demonstrate because the question of how do you escape this uh, loop with your brain, the fact that you always have to use your brain is inescapable. And if you can't trust your brain, then you can't trust that your brain is telling you when it trusts your brain that it should trust your brain. And it gets confusing because your conclusions about a God are also the product of your brain. Every instance of reasoning, every appeal to scripture that seems to say, ah, this ancient book says this, and therefore I should believe it, is an exercise in reasoning and is therefore subject to the rules of reasoning, and it can in fact be flawed. It's only when you think that you can't be wrong, which seems to be the case with apologists, particularly in the presuppositionalist realm, that you run into this problem. So in the end, is secular humanism superior to Christianity? Well, with respect to human flourishing, the standard that we agreed upon, we have one argument presented that secular humanism is in fact superior and a claim by the opposition that it can't be because the foundations are rooted in a parade of fallacious appeals to truth, certainty, and flatly ignoring the rules of the game. They also ignore any potential challenge to their fallacious appeals by just, well, that's just your brain fizzing. Where was the argument that told us what Christianity was? Even in his initial definition of Christianity, it told us what you can't be if you're a Christian, not what it takes to be one. And it didn't talk at all about methods, as I mentioned in my closing. Where was the Christian strategy, the clear explanation of Christian goals or methods? I got him to acknowledge that Christianity cares about human flourishing and that he does, although he seems to think that just having sex and procreating counts as fulfilling the robust subject of human flourishing, just as his views of consequentialism ignored the robust society in which we live and the fact that consequences go beyond the minute and specific and that he wants to narrow it down. Where was this defense of Christianity? Where was, here's something good that Christianity encouraged that couldn't be encouraged by secular humanism. Whereas here's something evil that secular humanism supports that couldn't be encouraged by Christianity. One of the other common questions I got was at the very end of this debate, I leaned over and I asked Matt a question and the comments on the video kept saying, Hey, what was that question you asked? What was that question? Because you could hear that I said something. And then Matt said, that's a good question. It was a question that was in my notes. And if we would have been able to have the discussion that I wanted to have about competing strategies for flourishing, I would have asked it. It was in my notes and I skipped it because of the game that he was playing with brain fizz, the game that he was playing that allowed him to avoid having to deal with difficult questions. So what was the question? Really simple. What is Christianity's position on cloning? This question exposes the problem of antiquated ideas that can't predict the sort of questions in the future. It doesn't even have a mechanism that might begin to address the issue. The closest that Christianity could come, barring a new revelation from God, is to engage in the same sort of post hoc interpretations that religions have engaged in for as long as the world around them has been rendering their ideas obsolete. How would secular humanism go about addressing it? By evaluating the consequences of the action with respect to the goal of human flourishing. 
in a framework that values equality and fairness. By using principles like the veil of ignorance and considering things like, what would the world be like if everybody took this action? The sort of think globally, act locally mentality. But most importantly, if secular humanism found that it had no mechanism to embrace and evaluate a new scenario like this, then secular humanism would be revised after reasoned discussion surrounding the values and a careful consideration of the evidence and the circumstances in which we find ourselves. Because secular humanism's strength is that the goal is to get better at getting better. This video is made possible by supporters of the Atheist Debates Patreon project. You can find more information and add your support at patreon.com slash atheistdebates.